There within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Here I am waiting a peace be still, and I love my child and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I Amen. Hey. 
Australia, Germany, we get emails from India, from everywhere, all over the United States, and these people who write to us. I got a very funny email, it's very comical, I don't know if the guy meant to or what, but I laughed when I read it. I got to read it to you, it's funny. Uh, he, the title of it is Angry. His name is Robert Himmelstein, H-E-M-E-L-H-I-M-E-L-S-T-E-I-N. And he says, Dear Jim, I live in Pennsylvania. My friend started me listening to you a couple of weeks ago on YouTube, and you started making sense to me until I listened to you with my friend. He kept asking me, what is the Texas Receptus? Texas, T-E-X-A-S. <laughs> what is the Texas Receptus this guy is talking about? So I looked the term up, and oh boy, was I surprised. What came up, every wide receiver of the Texans football team so being a Steelers fan, I just listen to you in, anymore. I don't listen to you anymore. Oh. That's funny. I asked my friend who recommended, I listened to you, if you ever talked about football, and he said you were a football fan. Well, to a degree. I used to be a Dallas fan. I was born in <laughs> Dallas, but I don't like Jerry Jones, who's the owner, and he's a jerk. So... Um, <laughs> And Mary likes the Kansas City Chiefs, so I'll just cheer for them. I really cheer for the individual. I like Brock Purdy, who is the quarterback with the uh, San Francisco 49ers because he is an outspoken Christian. I just root for the man. In fact, he said he loves Jesus with all his heart, and the reason he loves his new wife wife is because she loves Jesus and he used the word Jesus he didn't say the Lord and he's outspoken Christian he's real quiet he never brags or boasts if they get him out there with a linebacker and the linebacker's real loud and talking what we're going to do then he's just standing there going just real quiet real gentle I like Bob Purdy and I cheer for him. I'm not a San Francisco fan particularly, but I am a fan of his. Anyway, let me read the rest of this. I asked my friend who recommended, I listened to you, if you ever talked about football, and he said you were a football fan. Didn't know which team, and then I looked up where you, where you were, and I found out you were in Tennessee, the same state the Houston Oilers moved to. The Titans used to be the Houston Oilers, and used to. It's all about football. <laughs> this all made sense. You're trying to convince everyone in the world to root for the football teams that originally came from Texas. <laughs> Is that hilarious? <laughs> so we cannot watch you or listen to you anymore. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm talking for football teams. You are a very sneaky man. But I will check in and listen from time to time to keep tabs on you and warn others. Agape. <laughs> you are an ignorant man. It's not Texas receivers. It's Textus Receptus. That's a Latin word. Textus. <laughs> I, I just thought that was hilarious. I busted out laughing when I first read it. Textus, T-E-X-T-U-S, not Texas, 
Texas, Texas, R-E-C-E-P-T-U-S. That is a Latin word that means received text. It was an original text. It was written in Greek. There was no English 2,000 years ago. And here it is. It don't look like a football player. Here's the Texas Receptus right here. It's not a wide receiver for the Houston, <laughs> Houston Oilers. I think it's funny. It's the Greek text from the New Testament. There was no English, Spanish, or French 2,000 years ago. The Bible was written in, in Greek. That's why I go back to the Greek words. There it is right there. Greek is on the top line in the Textus, not Texas, Textus Receptus. I've never gotten as comical an email as that. I thought that was hilarious. It's, this is it. And you want to start with a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It's got every word of the Bible that's written in the Greek New Testament the New Testament is written in Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The Hebrew text is called the Maseratic text. Now, don't mix it up with Missouri. Missouri text. <laughs> Maseratic text. <laughs> I think that is hilarious, isn't it? That's funny. And it's got every word listed. And if it's a New Testament word, you look it up back here in the... Greek dictionary in the back. You look up the number that's right beside the verse and the word. If it's Old Testament, you look that up in the Hebrew dictionary in the back. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. Not Texas receivers. Not football games. Has nothing to do with football but the Greek. Did you get it? <laughs> I need to frame this. That is hilarious. Put that over here. I might want to keep that for future reference. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Now, let me read some more of these. Uh, these are emails I get from around the country and around the world. Ricky Collins is in Memphis, and he's been with us uh, several years writing to us and helping support us. Hello all. Thank you so much for thank you so very much again. Love all the lessons. And most grateful of all y'all's hard work. Agape Adelphos and Adel Adelphe. Jim, Dave, Mike, Tom and Miss Mary, y'all's truly, Ricky Collins in Memphis, a poor sinner who hopes to become a eudolos, a well slave, someday with the Lord's help and a lot of Jim's sermons and Greek words. That's from Ricky Collins in Memphis. He is a very gentle, tender-hearted guy, and I've talked to him several times. We love you, Ricky. Keep writing. And then... Hernan Roa in Colombia, that's in South America. Hello, Mike. I am no longer in Alfred's group. I don't know who that is. I'm not 100% sure of my salvation. Well, that's okay because you can't know absolutely for sure that you're saved. You have to see the change in your own life to know that you're a believer. However, I continue to watch the pastor's videos. Well, if you want to watch the truth and you embrace the truth and you're a believer, I know you're a believer more than you know it. And of course, on the narrow path, if you know there's a narrow way and you're on it and you're struggling going through trials and tribulations, you're one of God's people. God continues to shape my life his way. If you really believe that, you're one of God's people. I don't like it at all. Oh, neither do I. <laughs> I don't like sickness when he brings it in the hospital when he brings it and all kinds of problems. But 
can't do anything. That's right. Can't do nothing about it. You gotta, you're in there for the duration. Greetings. I'm still very connected alone. It doesn't matter because I have your channel at my complete disposal, which is the only thing I need. With appreciation, Hernan Roa in Colombia, South America. Thank you, Hernan. We love you, brother. Keep writing. And then uh, Dwayne in Smyrna writes to us. He comes from time to time when he can. And he writes and says, Hi, Pastor, do you have a BDAG, Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich lexicon? No, I don't. Uh, if you want to help me find one, I'll be glad to pay you for it. And do you recommend it? I'd like all lexicons because each one of them has a different take on a word. A lex lexicon means dictionary. That's all it means. And uh, these are dictionaries of words or lexicons of words. And Dwayne, we love you, brother. Keep writing. Ryan Spears, no address. Jim, after listening to some of your baptism videos, it sounds to me like baptism occurs when we repent, correct? Exactly. Baptism is blood. A blood baptism is death to self. But you don't die all of a sudden. It takes years to get rid of the outer man. We have an inner man that serves the law of God. That's the new birth. An outer man that serves the law of the flesh in Revelation, in Romans 7, in 2 Corinthians 4th chapter, uh, Colossians, the third chapter, Ephesians, the fourth chapter. These are all talking about the inner and the outer man. Uh, just everybody that keeps writing, Ryan. And then we got an email from Danielle Thigpen in Louisiana. Danielle is uh, the lady who, uh, she's a paraplegic. She was driving to her mother's house back about... 16 years ago and she fell asleep at night at the wheel and ran into a tree or a telephone post something like that and she became paraplegic and she started watching us on tv and she's converted and really believes the truth about predestination election and christmas is pagan and so forth and uh, we've put out a a uh, a message on the internet that we wanted to buy her a wheelchair accessible van. We had all these people send money. We have brought in considerable amount of money, enough to buy the van. It's up around $85,000, $90,000. It's in the bank, in the benevolent fund. Nobody can touch it. Nobody's going to touch it, but she's been very, very sick. She's supposed to go through this government program, and until she goes through it, and they help her get a job, like secretary job, where she can sit in one spot, then they, she has to have the job first, then we can buy the van. When that happens, the, the government will step in and pay for half of the van. That'll leave her about forty to $45,000. We can send her that by the month, maybe. 800 or $1,000 a month to get her started. But this is from Danielle. She writes, it's considerably long, but I'm going to read all of it. Hello, Pastor Jim and congregation. I write with great sadness, for I'm heartbroken and terribly grief-stricken. My mother passed away on Friday, March the 22nd, at 9.07 p.m. She went to the emergency room because she was having trouble breathing and had swelling in her lower extremities from buildup fluid due to having congestive heart failure. She was diagnosed in 2014. I got a very frightening call that she was in the last stages of heart failure with only 10% heart function. And the hospital was moving her to short-term hospice care to keep her comfortable before the inevitable. She didn't last even two weeks. I wasn't prepared to lose her. 
The Bible is true in all it says, for no man is promised tomorrow. James 4.14 speaks a little differently to me now, whereas you know not what is to be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Life goes fast. That's exactly true. I'll be 85 in the 16th of May, and it seems like the other day I was a teenager a few months ago. I mean, it doesn't seem very long. I remember the day I graduated from high school. I had an old 49 Chevrolet. It had a hole in the floorboard, and it was rusted out on the side. And I told Catherine Falls, I said, Catherine, would you back my car up? It seemed like yesterday. And she backed up and ran over my foot. I said, well, Catherine, get off my foot. Anyway, it just seemed like just the other day. I remember I had in my annual, I went around and had everybody sign it. I'll never forget one thing this one girl wrote. She said to a very strange, she was real cute. And I liked her, I liked her, and I wanted to maybe date her sometime or another. She said, to a very strange but looks nice boy. I think the reason I was strange is I was elect. You're strange when you're elect. I wasn't educated at that point, but I had a lot of conviction. And then she says, life goes by fast. I'm 42, but I was just 16 yesterday. Hey, that's just what I said. Don't some of you feel the same way? Exactly. It will be over before we know it. Each man is appointed unto death and then judgment, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I really believe this lady believes the truth. She wouldn't quote these verses if she didn't. My mom had many health problems but always seemed to bounce back. I never expected to lose her so suddenly. I'm not grieving for her as... She was a believer in truth, so disciplined for the kingdom and knew the true meaning of agape. I'm, I'm glad she says these things. What is the method of salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. She definitely believed, but I'm grieving for me. I'm sorrowful for me. I'm hurt. I'm sad for me. Well, you can't keep from being sad. But you have to know that death is on God's calendar and it's the timing for it. I'm constantly crying, sometimes just letting out guttural wails that I can't control. I've never known such heart-wrenching pain. I am drawing nigh unto the Lord, laying my cares and burdens upon Him. That's all you can do. I'm drawing near to Him. I'm abiding in Him and His Word. I'm seeking Him with all my with my all I'm knocking loudly I'm resting in him knowing he will work this as the Romans at Romans 28 8 28 moment in my life it's just so very hard right now it's supposed to be it's not supposed to be easy I, but you're doing the right thing you're seeking the truth in the word of God I am consumed with grief but I know the only way is through it. I will keep my eye on the good shepherd and remember God will deliver me from this massive Goliath in his appointed time. Oh, I like that. His will, his time, not mine. <laughs> I like that too. I would like to attend the picnic coming up in May. I think it would help me greatly. It really would. If things should change and I can't make it, I will surely let you know ASAP. My sweet pastor, I would like to attend in May and in October. God willing, God's truth is the only thing that keeps me sane. I praise his holy name for calling me to the kingdom citizenship. I praise his holy name for calling all of y'all to I'll conclude this because it rings hard for me after this great loss I'm dealing with. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Daniel Thigpen, 
Danielle Thigpen in Louisiana, lover of truth, lover of predestination, lover of, God, lover of agape, lover of legal sheep food, that's nomos, the word law, lover of the straight gate and narrow way, and so much more that is the word of God. I really believe that Danielle is getting a hold of these things. Danielle, we love you very much. I know a lot of people wonder, when is this going to happen? She's got to have a job for the government to step in and pay half of that. We could buy it, but when the government steps in, they'll put her through a program learning to drive the van. We can't do it before then. Then I got some YouTube comments. These are people that write, and some of them don't like me. Some of them do. West Facts 1 commented on why we do not believe in millennium or pre-trib rapture. Last Trump eliminates both. Surprised you quoted Matthew 24 as the end of the world. The Web Greek translation uses end of the age. End of the age is, is the word, is one of the words for world. And it means it's also the word forever. I don't know why people won't fight me on that, but they do. False history, mud floods, and post-millennial rain. All things are being revealed. Luke 8, 17. Um, if you want to write, you keep writing, Wes. Wes Facts. Vigilant veteran or Bitchuk commented on predestination prefixes in the Greek, the light to the Gentiles, concordance, part two. So if the horizon is the light, and it is, it wouldn't make sense that the horizon is allegorical for the dawn of the day or the morning star or Jesus Christ. The Bible says, he, he said, I am the light of the world. I guess it would. The word. And then he quotes, gives me Second Peter 1, 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein to you do well that you take heed as the light that shineth in darkness until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. The word day star is phosphorus, P-H-O-S-P, phos, P-H-O-R-U-S. Phosphorus is a form of the word phos, which is the word light. And phosphorus is a shining element, and Christ is the day star. And he gave me Revelation 2, 28 and 29. I will give him the morning star, and that's Christ. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And then he gave us Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you of these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of the David and the bright and morning star. That's true. And vigilant veteran, if you want to keep writing, keep writing. Jay Torres writes to us, commented on predestination, it's in the Bible, believe it. In that case, maybe you might not be saved. What? All that work you're doing, we're saved by, not by works, but listen, we're saved by a working faith. Faith without works is dead. You're saved to do the works of God. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Don't you believe that? That was created to do the right works of God, to do good works, agathos works, beneficial works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All the Baptist preachers want to quote Romans 2, 8, 9, but they never get to 2, 10. Maybe you hadn't read 2, 10. Snowman writes to us about the dragon. One head is wounded to death. Pastor Jim, what, what a meat-filled message you have served up here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Snowman. Keep writing to us. Then I got a long email, but I can't read it all.
because it quote, quotes a lot of verses. Jesus is Lord. Everyone going to acknowledge Jesus as their Lord. Now, those that acknowledge Jesus as Lord, are they merely mouthing it? Or they admit that Jesus is there? And they bring out all these verses when it talks about Every tongue shall confess in Philippians, the second chapter. Let me read that to you. And he brings that out. It doesn't say every tongue in the world. Every, every is feminine gender. Every means every tongue of the wife, the bride of Christ will confess. It doesn't mean every tongue that's alive will eventually go to heaven. That's not what it says. You've got to look at the genders of things. And he says, yet I will leave seven. He goes into all this. Just think about that. I've been thinking about all these verses uh, for 67 years. I started studying Bible 67 years ago. I'm not new at this. Maybe you are. In the end, everyone will love Jesus. They will not. What about the vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction? Romans 9, 22. God willing to show his wrath and make his power known. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What, the, what about the worm that dieth not and the fire is not quenched? It doesn't mean there's a fire out there that's burning and will never go out. It means there'll be men in that forever. It would be redundant to say, never quenched, and there's nobody in it. You really don't understand. Buying goes along with kissing. Kissing, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, that's a lot of love. Smooch, smooch, smooch. That's not... A holy kiss was kissing on the face or kissing on the neck. That was a holy kiss to the brothers. Greet every man with a holy kiss. That's enough of that. Enough said. All right. What did I do with that other paper? All right. I'll move this all out of the way. I will. Let me make a few announcements. We are, we are on TV in Nashville Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night on Comcast channel 49 at 8.30. So we have Comcast be watching us. Uh, same thing as Xfinity, okay? If you have Xfinity, that is Comcast. And uh, we're on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for an hour, hour and a half. So be watching us. We, we're on the Internet all over the world. You can join us every Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock while we live stream. Just go to graceandtruth.net. And that's us. And there I'll be there teaching. We've got over 2,000 of our messages on the Internet, 4,330 as of today. And uh, we've got over 4,300 messages, but 2,000 of them are on the Internet. So watch us on the Internet, graceandtruth.net. We try to help some of these people that are in a struggle. Danielle Thigpen down in southern Louisiana, besides the money we have taken for her, a wheelchair-accessible van. If When you're in a wheelchair, you can you have a little clicker, a little remote, and you punch a button and the doors will open and a little uh, incline will come down and she can run her wheelchair up in that and there's a big wide open space between the front, two front seats and the back seat and she can pull up in there and go up into the driver's area and they will keep that seat out so that she can hook up correctly to it and her starter her accelerator and brakes are all right there at the steering wheel but she has to be taught to drive that by the government people and when she does 
we will send the part that they contact us and tell us they need this amount of money. It's going to sit there in the bank gathering interest. Nobody's going to get to it. Uh, it's there for her when she gets through this sick period that she's in. She's got some real bad sickness. We'd like for her to have that van. I don't know what it's like not being it having a broken uh, back and she can't move from the waist down just from the waist up. That's got to be very difficult. And uh, we give money to her, 200 a month to her, besides the van. And then we give 300 a month to a lady in Australia. She's got cancer. She came out of remission and she's it's activated again. We give 300 a month to a lady in Amarillo, Texas. She's got leukemia, and it'll activate from time to time. They've got debilitating diseases that will probably eventually get them. And, uh, of course, I'm getting old, and disease might get me any time. But it's going to get all of us. It's a point under man wants to die. Appointed means a set time. Apokime, it means it's set. And you can't live one second past it or die one second before it. Every, it's been appointed to men to die on a certain spot a certain day. And that's what the Bible says. Some people say, I don't believe that. It was because you don't believe the Bible. That's why. All right. Uh we got a picnic coming up May the 18th. Uh, we're going to be here at Moss Ride Park. It's right next to Hendersonville. Uh, it's Goodlesville, but Hendersonville and Goodlesville city limits set on the same line. So it's just going to be down the road. It's not far from the church here. And we're going to have a picnic May the 18th. You can bring whatever. We don't have a stove there. We're not able to cook there, so bring something that's already cooked. Uh, salads or something or whatever. Potato salad or macaroni or whatever you want to bring. And uh, we'll, we'll be... Uh, uh, I was looking for something. Anyway, that's enough announcements, I guess unless I have something else I can't think of. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I need to move this. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth above everything. God, help us. Help us in everything we do. Lord, we've got many people that want to stop this ministry. Stop me, Lord. Stop them. Be my defender and fight our battles for us. God, we thank you for everything you do. I thank you for dealing with me that I'm not the man I used to be that I am completely different than when I was young, wanting to be somebody and a star. Thank you for truth. God will give you praise for everything that you do because everything is your will. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm ready, Mike.
I'll probably add everything. I'll be adding to that along the way. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always introduce myself because we are live streaming all over the world. People are watching us in Germany and Holland and in France and all over Africa and Australia and, and in Japan and everywhere in the world that you've got the Internet. People are watching us. And I'm teaching on some things I've got it up on the board. I've been talking about, I'm starting to talk to you about the mark of the beast. Mark has a definition. I gave everybody, I gave everybody this, two papers. One has got every time the word mark is used in the New Testament, right? And I've got it outlined, I've got it outlined in, highlighted in yellow. That's every time the word mark is used. And then I've got, when you look up in Strong's Concordance, I've got the, the in the concordance, you look up mark, and it's 5480. That's the top part of this paper that you've got where it says karagma. That's the word mark. Mark of the beast, C-H- a R A G M A. And notice what it says. It says that it comes from, it means it's a form of 5482. 5482 is the word carax. C H A R A X. Carax. Carax, if you'll notice, well, let's go ahead and read Caragma a scratch or an etching, stamp, a badge of servitude. What that shows, a badge of service. Now the Bible says in Romans, the sixth chapter, let's look at that very quickly because this is very important. It's a badge of servitude. It means... Whoever you are serving, there's a mark on you. There's a mark that shows who you're serving. Romans, the sixth chapter, Romans 6. And look here. This will tell you what the servitude is. Romans 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield your servants, your to whom you yield yourself, servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey. It depends on who you're obedient to. That's the mark. Whom you obey, whether of sin unto death. There's only two things you'll obey. Sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's very interesting in John the third chapter, I believe it's verse 3, 3 I think it is, maybe 4. No, you're not. It says sin is the transgression of the law. And that word transgression is the word A-N-O-M-I-A. -A. It means it comes from namas, N-O-M-O-S, and the alpha privative, which negates the word namas, means legal food for sheep or for animals, for us. That's the word law. The alpha privative, first letter of the Greek alphabet, negates that word, 
and it means no law or iniquity is the other word that's used for this word transgression, I-N-I-Q-U-I-T-Y. It's the word anomia. Anomia is the word. So that's what sin is. And if you yield yourself to sin, you're taking the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast has been here since the garden. It, did, it doesn't start with the end of time. It's always been here. If there was a beast in the garden, was there a beast in the garden? The beast was the world ruling system. Babylon ruled the world. Persia ruled the world. Greece ruled the world. And Rome ruled the world. That was the beast in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 13. A lion, a bear, and a leopard, and a beast with iron teeth. That was the beast. Was there a beast in the garden? The serpent in 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 Genesis 3 and 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Is he going to rule there in the garden? You bet your life he is. He's going to rule. The word serpent is the word nakash. Nakash that's the mark of the beast there. It was in the garden. I've got up here. The mark of the beast is Christmas, Valentine's Day, Halloween, Easter, water baptism, crackers and grape juice, charismatic doctrine, faith healing, Pentecostal tongues, accept Christ as your personal Savior, sinner's prayer, and every other easy gospel. It's another Jesus. That's the mark of the beast. Removing the bound. Tracy said that before we started. And Israel removed the bound to take in. If this is Israel, they moved the bound in Hosea, the fifth chapter. Hosea, fifth chapter, to take in. They moved the boundary of God. They move the bound is when it translated in the Septuagint is the word horas. It means border. Horas. They move the border of Israel to take in Baal and the grove out of out of what we call Lebanon. It was Tyre and Sidon. And they move the boundary to take in the god of Remen of Syria. And they move the bound to take to take in the god of Molech, which was the god, the chief sun god of Jordan. We call it Jordan, but it's the land of Ammon. And they moved the bound to take in the gods of of uh, of uh, southern Jordan, Moab. Moab, their chief god was Shemash. Shemash. What's amazing, Shemash comes from Shemesh, S-H-E-M-E-S-H, and Shemesh is the word son in the Hebrew, Shemesh. And they moved the bound to taking all the gods of Egypt down here. If this is the Mediterranean Sea, and this is Egypt down here. They brought in. You can find out that they took all the gods of Egypt in. And they took those in in Ezra. Ezra, the ninth chapter, the first four verses, one through four. And you'll find that they took in all the gods of Egypt in that same section, plus the gods of the Moabites, excuse me, the gods of the Ammonites, I'm saying these twice. The gods of the Perizzites, the gods of the Hittites, and all these Ites gods which were here in Israel, which they didn't drive out. They took in all their gods, which were sun and tree gods. So that's what they did. They moved the bound, and they took in all these gods, which became the Christ mass. It became Christ mass and Valentine's Day and Halloween and Easter, and then you get into water baptism. 
the, all of these are an easy gospel. It's real easy. Don't you notice something? The way you make something innocent that is evil, you simply shift the character from adults to children. And what they did, Christmas is a child's time. That's where you get gifts and St. Nicholas, a Roman Catholic priest of the 4th century, he was a Roman Catholic bishop, comes to your house and St. Nicholas is the same thing as it found it found its way over to Holland and became Santa Claus, and then it found its way to America and became Santa Claus. It, it's a child's festival, and people say, if children get gifts, let them go talk to Santa Claus down at the, at the uh, center. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says the gift perverts the wise. A gift will pervert wise people and it will make you think that you're, that you're getting something that you're not getting. And it puts your approval on them, on these wrong things. Christmas is a child's festival. They've turned that feast of Saturn into something for children so they can make it look innocent. Yet people are having parties down town nashville uh downtown and all the big cities and they're and what they're doing they're getting drunk and they're and they're laying aside their marriage vows so they can have a sexual tryst with a woman and and uh, many of them get pregnant in the 1800s they did a study after christmas nine months from christmas which is the gestation of a baby in a womb of a woman they had more illegal births nine months after Christmas than ever before. So it's not like innocent. See, the Christians out here in Hendersonville at some big Baptist church, they say this is innocent, and we want to be a part of what they're doing down there in Nashville at some office party. We're not supposed to have anything to do. Therefore, shall you keep in mind the ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. God didn't tell him in that verse in Luke 18 and Leviticus 18 and 30, don't worship their gods. In that verse, he said, don't do what they do. Don't put up a tree. Don't give each other gifts. The Feast of Saturn was an orgy. God doesn't, it was an orgy that lasted from the 14th, the 17th of December through the 24th of December. It was an orgy, a seven-day orgy where they had all kinds of promiscuity and license to do anything they wanted to do. It would be men with men, women with women, with animals in the street and getting drunk and getting on all kinds of mind-altering drugs or whatever they had at that time. I do. I believe they were taking drugs back then. Certainly they were. They found out what that was. Now, so this is, they moved the boundary line. If you'll notice, they turned it into something supposedly innocent. They turned it into a child's festival. Then they turned it to Valentine's. I remember when I was in elementary school, all the kids would get Valentine's for everybody else, and I was hoping I'd get one from this girl named Charlene. And it just, all it does is make something that's wicked, it makes it innocent so the parents can do what they want to do. If they say, well, it's innocent, it's Valentine's. Valentine's was Roman Catholic. I've gone through that with you the last time. Halloween is innocent. It's for children. When you go outside, they go from door to door and they get candy, trick or treat. And that way the parents can feel innocent in what they do. Well, it's just for kids. And kids go out and they get killed and they get, they get raped and they get all kinds of murder and 
and just devious underhanded by people out there in public. I don't believe kids be ought to be going from door to door in the middle of the night. Do you? I don't think they should because a lot of them die. They even put poison in the bags. So Halloween, Easter, Easter is for children, Easter bunnies, little rabbits. The reason they have bunnies is because rabbits multiply at breakneck speed. They're one of the fastest reproducing animals in the world. You have a male and female rabbit, and then in six weeks you've got 12 of them. And then you got 12 more, six weeks more. It's, it's about fertility is what the rabbits were about. That's what the egg was about. The egg is the beginning of fertility. So it's a, they've turned it all into something innocent, Easter. Well, I've gone through all that. Let me give you some things. Let me put this word back on the board. C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. You cannot leave the definition of anything behind. That's why I gave you this right here. I give you this every time the word mark is used in Revelation. And then I've got this is, this is the definition of the word. You cannot leave definition behind. I believe the mark of the beast is here. It's on its way. It has to do with something that people don't understand. But when you look at Karagma, it will say it comes from 4982, uh, 5482, which is the word Karax. Karax means a stake, a palisade. What is a palisade? A palisade is a fort. It's a fence around something. It's a rampart. It's for military mound. It means a trench. There's one place, the first place in the Bible where God made a trench. He made a palisade. A palisade is the same thing as a protective fence. God says there's a tree in the middle of the garden. That's, the, that's where the mark of the beast starts. The mark of the beast is not just some revelation thing. There's a tree in the midst of the garden, and I've got, I believe it's a Christmas tree, and I've got a fence around it, and thou shalt not go beyond that palisade, that trench that steak, that carox. You can't go beyond that and eat of that tree. Well, when the serpent came to Eve, Nakash, Nakash is the word serpent. Serpent, Nakash means to whisper Or to enchant. It means to make one feel good. Now the mark of the beast, everybody's looking for a wild, growling, fire-breathing something. That's not going to be it. How does Satan get his message over? I believe the mark of the beast is wrapped up in the word deceive. Deceive, deceive and deception. That's what he did. He deceived Eve and, and she, he convinced her to do something against, I believe the mark of the beast has to do with against the word of God. That's a whole thing. I don't believe the mark of the beast is something new. Look at the rest of this definition. You cannot leave this definition. Look here. He says it comes from Karax, which means a palisade, a rampart, a military mound. Do not go beyond this mound or this trench. 
I don't know whether God built a trench, but there was a spiritual mound palisade there. You can't go beyond this. That's, that was where Satan took his mark. And what he did in deceiving, he appeals to the flesh. Appeals to flesh. That's it. When he appeals to the flesh, that's transgression against the laws of God. That means no law. That's the word iniquity. The word sin is the word hamartia in the Greek. H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. Or hamartano, H A. M-A-R-T-A-N-O. Now remember, there's no H's in the Greek. There's the diacritical mark before it. Hamartia. But they'll put the H in when you look up the word sin in the Greek. Sin is a construction of meros. Means a portion to eat of. Remember when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 12, we are members in particular, members in particular, the word particular is meros. And when Jesus came to the apostles in Luke, the 24th chapter, and he had been resurrected from the dead, he said, have you anything to eat? And they gave Jesus a piece of fish. The word peace is the word meros. Back to this word hamartia. Sin is actually the word meros with the alpha privative in front of it. It means no legal food, no food from God. That has the basic same definition as no law, iniquity, because law means legal food for sheep. So this means no food, and this means no food. Sin and iniquity have the basic same definition. Now, I want us to look at this. Look at this. Look at, go back to your paper on, on Mark. Karagma. It says it, it says it comes from 5482 and when you look at 5481 that's also a form of karagma or karax the word 5481 is corrupter c-h-a-r-a-k-t-e-r c-h-a-r-a-k-t-e-r corrupter means character. You, when you have the mark of the beast, you have his character there, don't you? What's the character of Satan? Contradict God's word. That's it. That's the mark of the beast. Just You say, how in the world are we having a mark of the beast now? It's going on right now. The character of Satan is going on in the world. All of the preachers that preach these things, they're preaching against God's word. Christmas is Christ. Mass. God doesn't want us eating of the flesh, eating of the, eating of the literal flesh. That's against God's law in Leviticus 17th chapter. It's against God's law for man to eat flesh. But Jesus explains that when he says, my flesh is meat indeed. That's the mass of Roman Catholicism. 
Indeed is the word alethes, A-L-E-T-H-E-S. Alethes means of truth. And truth is the word aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. And truth has a meaning. The Bible says, Thy word is truth, and the Holy Spirit is truth. There in John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. And Luke, and in the book of Luke 17, 17, thy word is truth. So the Holy Spirit, the word, and the truth are all the same. Truth is the word aletheia. It comes from lanthano. means to hide or conceal, to lie hid, conceal. The alpha, first letter as a negative particle, it tells you when you look at the word truth, from the alpha as a negative, it says neg part. It means negative particle, negates the word lanthano. It means not to hide or conceal anything. That's what I'm doing on I'm telling you about Christmas and Valentine's and Halloween and all the rest of this heathenism. So let's get back over here. So it means the character. Let's read that. A graver of a person the same as 5982. The tool or the person engraving or character now god doesn't have to use an engraving tool to mark us see we receive a mark of god but he calls it a seal 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 is the word it's the word sphragis s p h r a g i s it comes from the word sfragizo. We get the, this is the verb form. S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. Sfragizo means signature. God has got a signature he's good and put up on us. And that shows that we belong to him. I, I was going to go into the word seal, but I don't know. I can get into all of it. So this is talking about, then it says, it says character, the figure, the stamp, representation, an exact copy. Now that's an exact copy of Satan. We have a seal, an exact copy of Christ, and that is what we are predestined to. We're predestined for whom he did for no. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image, icon, the exact likeness of Christ. He puts that in our hearts. This is not some stamp. This is not a literal stamp somebody puts on you. It's not an embedded, uh, some kind of chip. It's not what it is. It's not God writing something on your forehead. He's put it in your mind. That's the seal of God. And we, we have his seal when we, when we want to do right, we want to live right, we want to live righteously for the Lord. And most of the world doesn't want that. Most of the world has the mark of the beast. The Bible says that. The Bible says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in there. Most people have the mark on them right now. Most people are not going to heaven when they die. And then he says, Karox. I don't want to miss anything on this. Karox. To sharpen to a point through the idea of scratching a stake a palisade, a rampart. Let me read to you. It says engraving or character. Let me read the word character to you. I got into, I take out my Webster's Dictionary. I've got 
one at home. I got one up here. I got two or three at home. And you want a Webster's Dictionary that has, uh, I got it up here somewhere. But it's got the original word meanings. When you go into the word character in the Webster's Dictionary, it will tell you character means the distinctive quality from the Greek character. It tells you it comes from, our word character comes from the word character. Our word character originated with that. It originated with a representation. That's the character of a person. Whatever the character of Satan is, and people do not have any allegiance to the Word of God, that's the character. It goes on to say, character, graphic device placed on an individual do to show ownership, shows who owns you. That's what character is. That's what the mark of the beast is. It shows the ownership of God by what men do, by what's in their heart. That's the ownership. Let me go on with the, some of these things. It de and it distinguishes the state of being of a person, whether he belongs to God or whether he belongs to Christ. What shows the difference between belief and unbelief? Love of the truth or love of the world? What, what did Eve see in that tree? The character of Satan was in the tree. The mark was in the tree. When Satan comes along and he says, God doesn't really mean what he said. Let me tell you what. That's what the mark of the beast is. That's where Satan comes along and says, God don't mean what he says. He means something else. All preachers say, well, Christmas is the birthday of Jesus, and what you're studying out of the Old Testament don't mean what it says. It means exactly that. Let me read a verse to you that I, I read to you earlier, or quoted earlier. It's over in Leviticus 18 and 30. Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 and 30. Every one of these doctrines are comfortable. They're easy. They don't have tribulation connected with the Christmas of the world. I said this before. I preached a message on Christmas as a ceasefire. That's what all of these are. Christmas and Valentine's and Halloween and Easter are all a seats fire. What they are, my younger brother told me one time, because I had conviction when I was in gospel music and the people didn't like me for what I said. And he said, you're always rocking the boat. You bet your life I'm rocking the boat when I'm calling somebody down for their sin. He said, you're always making waves. If you don't make waves and rock the boat, there's something wrong with your believing life. You have to rock the boat. That's exactly opposite of a ceasefire. Rock the boat. You've got to make waves. During World War I, I'll tell you again, the Germans and the Americans were fighting. They dug these real deep trenches instead of foxholes. And they'd get inside their trench, and the trench might be this high. A guy six foot two or three could get see over it, and they'd have to get some little ladder to get up and look over the trench. And all of, the, all of the Germans and the Americans 
they had an agreement they would meet in no man's land, which is the land between the two trenches where they're firing at each other, trying to kill each other. They had an agreement that they would go out here into no man's land and that they would, between the trenches, right in the middle where the battle was taking place, and they agreed that they would put up a Christmas tree out there and all the Germans with their German helmets and their, uh, they didn't have swastikas in, that was, comes in with Hitler. But all the Germans and all the Americans went out there and they sang Christmas carols together and they had a ceasefire. Mm. Then they went back to their trenches and started shooting each other and trying to kill each other. These things here, Christmas to, to the America is a ceasefire. Valentine is a ceasefire. Don't tell people what it is, it's Roman Catholicism. It was... Romulus and Remus being being suck, being suckered by a she wolf and raising them. Don't tell them what Halloween is, where where this is the death of the saints and they had to come back from the dead and they had to be fed from the dead. Don't tell them what Easter is. That's a resurrection of Tammuz in the ancient world. It's not the resurrection of Jesus. Don't tell the people the truth. This is a ceasefire. Don't rock the boat by telling the truth, Jim Brown. That's what my brother kept telling me. You're rocking the boat. Because those gospel singers were a bunch of heathens. You guys know that. I had one of them, a very famous gospel singer, sings with a gospel group, but they've become country. I saw him in a restaurant one day, and he said, Come here, Jimmy. And I, most of you wouldn't know his name, but you would know the name of the group he's with. He said, Come here. And he said, Sit down here a minute. He said, Don't tell those preachers in those churches about us when you go into them because we have to follow you in. In other words, we're heathens, we drink, we smoke pot, but we don't want you telling those preachers that. They're really <coughs> wicked people. So all of that has to do with leave it alone. You know what this is about? Live and let live. It's about rock. It's about ceasefire. Don't tell people what they need to do. Don't tell them Christmas is wicked as he is. How easy is it to celebrate their Christmas? It's like falling off a log. How easy is it to do Valentine's, buy somebody a Valentine's uh, candy and, and take it to them? They're not going to fight you over that. How easy is it to to do Halloween and send your kids out and say, and be sure and get all the candy you can. How easy is it to have Easter and Easter eggs and an Easter bunny? It's easy as falling off along. How easy is water baptism? That's like, it's no problem at all. If you, if you don't know what baptize means, being dipped in water is walking down the aisle and saying, I want to accept Christ as my personal Savior. And he says, well, we need to baptize you in water, and that way you'll be home free. And you're not. Baptize does not mean, I keep saying this, water baptism is easy. Being saved is not easy. If the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely. First Peter, the fourth chapter, Peter said, if the righteous scarcely, Mogus, comes to the Lord Molus, which means with great difficulty. See, when you're saved, God puts it in your heart to do righteous works. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them even though we don't want to walk in them and we don't want to do the right thing. And when you're young, you don't want to, you don't want to do right. You want to have fun and play and, and go out and, and dance and smoke and drink and whatever. You don't want to do right for God. 
when you're young. I didn't. Did you? Huh? Did you want to do right? I didn't want to do right. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to become rich and famous. Had the voice to do it, but I didn't know how I could do it otherwise. They, there's no tribulation. When Paul was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra, he said, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Tribulation is the narrow way. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few find it. Narrow is the word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. And thalibo is a form of the word thalipsis, which is the word tribulation every time you find it. Tribulation is thalipsis. Thalibo means to be pressured from all sides by people in the world because they don't like this message. Do you talk to people about these things? You don't have to get mad at people and jump all over them and scream at them and preach at them. I just talk to people all the time. Every time I get a chance, I'll say, I'm a, I'm a Bible teacher and I teach from the Greek and the Hebrew text. And I say, I teach things that other people don't say. And I've had people say, like what? I say, well, Christmas is paganism. It's Roman Catholicism. It was against the law to celebrate it 300 years ago in America. Did you know that? And every time some secretary or some waitress would say, I've never heard that before. I say, it is. We're not supposed to be doing it. And I'll leave it with, I'll leave that with them and leave them alone. If they're elect, all you have to do to the elect is feed them a little bit of sheep food. That's all, just one bite. And if they are sheep, they're going to chew on it and swallow it and digest it. And they may not say something that day, but somewhere down the line, they're going to start investigating it because you fed them the right food. But most of the world's going to get mad at you because they don't want to hear that all this is an easy gospel. It's another Jesus. Christmas is another Jesus. Valentine's is another Jesus. Halloween is another Jesus. Easter is another Jesus. And in water baptism is another Jesus because you can walk down the aisle and the preacher will dip you in water and you say, I'm home free. And you're not. Because that's not baptism. Baptism is, all of this is the mark. It's the it's the character of the beast. He has convinced the world that you have an easy religion. You don't have to struggle. You don't have tribulation. I've got a paper here that talks about all these things that we have to go through. In Acts 14, 22, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy 3, 12 Yea, and all that will of godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then Philippians 1.29. Unto you at Philippi, it's given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for his sake. All Christians are supposed to suffer for Christ. It's given. The word given is very interesting. Charizomai, C-H-A-R-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Charizomai, this is Philippians 1.29. That's one of the first verses I memorized when I was young, a young preacher somewhere around 1962, Philippians 1.29. I thought, whoa. I read that and went, is that me? Unto you it is given, charizomite comes from charis, which is the word grace, and the word kara, which is the word joy or rejoice. Charizomite, it is given in the behalf of Christ. Not a charizo means to grant. As a favor, God has favored you by giving you not only to believe upon him, 
but to suffer for his sake. That goes completely against this easy Jesus up here of Christmas, this easy Jesus of Valentine's, this easy Jesus of Halloween, this easy Jesus of, of Easter, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel in Second Corinthians 11 and 4. It's given to you on behalf of Christ, not only just to believe upon him. Let me give you a couple more of these. He says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 6, you, came, you became followers of us in much affliction. That word affliction is the same word as tribulation. Philipsis, same word. 1 Thessalonians 3. 3 and 4. Let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. I, like, I really like this because this is telling it like it is. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. First Thessalonians 3. And 3. No man should be moved by these afflictions. That word affliction, the ellipsis, is the same word as tribulation, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. Moved is the word sino, S-A-I-N-O. means to be shaken. We get the word S-C-I-S-M-O. A seismograph is one that measures the earthquakes. Don't be shaken. No man should be shaken by these afflictions, for yourselves know that you were appointed thereto. Kimai, it was laid out like a track in front of you. K E I M A I. It was a track that's laid out. It's laid out, these afflictions are laid out for every believer. No man should be moved by these afflictions knowing that you were appointed to. And then he goes, let me give you another one here. James 1, 2. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You have to be tried you have to go through trial, like First Peter 1 and 7. The trial of faith is trial of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire, by persecution, by every kind of difficulty in life. And then First Peter 3 14, happy are ye if you suffer for righteousness sake, you're happy. You're Makurios. M-A-K-U-R-I-O-S. Mm -hmm. Fortunate. You're fortunate if you are suffering for truth. And then and then in all these verses do not match up with these Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's, and Easter. They don't match up with it. The preachers are lying. And then he says here in John sixteen thirty three, in the world you have you shall have tribulation, thalipsis, but I have overcome the world. Overcome, remember that word? Nikao. Overcome is nikao. It's a it's a verb form of nike, which is the word victory. Nike. And what is the victor that overcomes the world? Even our faith or death to self. You have to die to self to go through this real thing about Christmas, which is Roman Catholicism, the real thing about Valentine's, which is Roman Catholicism, the real thing about Halloween, which is Romanism, the real thing about Easter, that's all Roman Catholicism, all of it. I don't really care what preachers say. I'm at a place, the whole world has been seduced by the mark of the character of the beast. They've been seduced. And then in Luke 6, 22, Blessed are ye 
when men hate you. They don't hate stars. They don't. The Bible says, warn you when all men speak well of you. If you're, if you're Carrie Underwood and she's a big superstar and beautiful and got a great voice and walks out on Monday night, on Sunday night football naked practically and claiming that she got saved when she's eight years old in some Baptist church, I don't believe you, Carrie. You got the other Jesus. You got the wrong Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible says you have to go through tribulation, you have to suffer. Do you take a stand and tell the people from the stage that Christmas is pagan, Easter's pagan? Do you tell them they have to repent? Do you tell them that predestination is true? I don't think she does. It's not just her, it's all the rest of them. All the rest of the stars. If the world loves you, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. If you are a superstar... If you're a famous football player, a famous singer, I can't even think of all those people. I can always think of Carrie Underwood because she walks out there stripped down to nothing and claims to be a Christian. Little girl, you are disgusting to me. Don't call yourself. And beside that, she believes in homosexual marriage. Where is all this headed to? What is... What is the main thing? I've got others that I need to read to you here, but I won't for right now. <coughs> what is this mark of Satan, mark of the beast? It's accepting a perversion of God's Word. All of this, the way the world is celebrating Christmas and Valentine's, Halloween, Easter, when Constantine, you know what that is? There's one word that expresses all this. One word. Does anybody tell me what it is? <coughs> Tolerance. Is that going on today? What about political correctness? Don't make waves, don't rock the boat, be politically correct and don't make anybody mad. Let homosexuals marry homosexuals. Let lesbians marry lesbians. Now this thing is getting crazy. They're saying, let men who have been converted to transsexualism, let them compete. This is on the news right now. Let them compete with women in sports. Even though they're stronger, they're faster, and they're going to outdo the women in sports, let them do that. That's, that's called tolerance. That's called idiocy. Let some woman that weighs 130 pounds uh, run against one of these linebackers with the Pittsburgh Steelers that weighs 270 pounds and he's six foot six. Watch her. Watch her get her neck broken. Her back brushed open. It, it's insane. Everything goes. The Black Lives Matter thing, I believe Black Lives Matter, but I believe White Lives Matter. It depends on if God wants them to matter. But the Black Lives Matter was just, it was a political thing, and I don't think the black people knew this. It was a political thing to pull the homosexuals over and say, hey, Homosexual lives matter. We should be able to marry and get insurance and get and get all the breaks that married couples get because I love this guy and I'm a guy and I love this woman and I'm a woman. Now it's let everything go. This is what the eighth chapter, uh, the seventh chapter of of uh, Daniel's talking about. They're calling good evil and evil good. They're changing times and laws. They're changing all of God's laws. And that all has to do with tolerance, political correctness. If this thing of political correctness keeps going, and I believe it absolutely will, it's going to get insane. What it is, it's going to say, if you don't go along 
with Christmas and Valentine's and Halloween and letting these people marry each other and letting them commit sin and put your approval on it. We're going to put you in jail, Jim Brown. I will expect one day I'm saying such plain things. I sat up at night trying to think of some way to say things plainer than I'm doing it. And somebody, they'll come in the door one day and say, we're bringing a cease and desist order on you, Jim Brown. You can go home, but you can't preach what you're preaching anymore. It's against our tolerance. That's what the Roman Catholic Church was founded on. When Constantine... Let me go over here to another map. Right here. When Constantine was having problems with all these Huns, these Vandals, these Astragos and Goths and Visigoths, and all these Burgundians and all these, these hordes coming across the European continent and invading what later on would be Europe, he was Constantine was afraid he was going to lose the empire down here. Well, this is the very character of Satan that he brought out. He said, I, I can't control them. And I'm having a problem controlling the Christians that are coming out of Israel, the ones that are converted to Christianity, and they're moving all over the world. And I am and I'm slaughtering them just as fast as I can. And I can't control them. And I can't control these, these barbarians. So I want, I'm going to pass a law that these people over here and these people over here can come into the church, the corrupt church at Rome, which would later be the Roman Catholic Church, and they can come into this church and get along and and they can and we're going to tolerate each other. And so we issued an edict of Milan. And it's called an edict of toleration. That's the mark of the beast. It's here already. It always has been since the garden. We've been told you've got to tolerate America's belief on Christmas, Valentine's, Halloween, and Easter. And we've got to tolerate the Baptist dipping in water. So when he issues this edict of toleration, it's the same thing all through the Bible. You've got to tolerate... The way they're interpreting Christmas is sin. The way they're interpreting Valentine's is sin. The way they're interpreting Halloween and Easter is sin. The way they're interpreting, interpreting water baptism is sin. All you have to do is walk down the aisle and get dipped in water. That's not even baptism. I just am astounded that nobody has gone into the history of baptism that I can know of, I, the man that wrote the book, Baptizo, what is it? He wrote a tremendous book. We've, I don't know if we've got any of them here, but he says that baptize was not, did not mean immersion. Baptize, Mr. Strong and Strong's, in, uh, in the uh, McClinic and Strong, he will say, if you look up in the B volume, baptism, he says, baptism was not a verb. He put, this is his exact words. It's not a verb implying motion. Motion is the movement of a action verb. Jump, run, throw, baptize into water, a dipping of the person. He says it does not mean that. It's not a verb. He said it's a noun. A noun is a person, place, or thing. I learned that about the fifth or sixth grade in Fort Worth, Texas at Diamond Hill Elementary School. I learned that back then. And I've been learning it ever since. It's a noun, a person, place, or thing. This is a thing, baptism. It is a verbal noun, 
Why does it sound like a verb? That's because it's got verbal character. It, it does not mean anything that's easy is not Christianity. I like that title. Anything that's easy is not Christianity. Christianity is not easy. When God convicts your heart, do you, do you want to go out here and tell people the truth? I do. Every day. I don't beat anybody up. I just talk to them real simple. And I say, I say it like this. I said it to a guy the other day. I said, baptized does not mean to immerse or dip in water. I said, it has to do with an individual. And the fluid has to come from an outer source, from God. And it has to stain and die the person. It was a dyer's term in the first century. It meant to stain and dye clothes. It has to come from an outer source and splash the person all over with a red stained blood dye. And what really gets me in the seventh chapter of Revelation, the Bible says, he's washed, he's done the washing. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's baptism. It is not water. But how easy is it? Is this easy? No. When God baptized you with the blood, a blood baptism was a death. Death to self. Self is what the mark of the beast was about in the garden. Eve saw a tree. She crossed the boundary line and went over to the tree that was forbidden. It was forbidden food. It was anomia. It was, it was hamartia, no legal food. And she went into the tree in the garden. Here's what she saw. Everything that the mark of the beast is about is about fulfilling the flesh, about fulfilling the outer man. You got an outer man that serves the law of the flesh, and a man that doesn't have an inner man cannot conquer the flesh. You got an inner man that's Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ, and he tells you, you got to stop thinking the way you think. Eve saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. And it would make her wise. This, when you transgress the law of God and you partake of that tree, you're partaking of the mark of Satan or the character. Every time you see mark, just put character because that's what it is. Walking the aisle and accepting and letting some Baptist preacher dip you in water, some Church of Christ preacher, crackers and grape juice, that is not what they were eating. They were eating the last Passover. If you'll let somebody talk you into that, that how much time do I have, Mike? 30. 30. All right. Let me get back over here. You have to, she saw a tree that was good for food. And John, 1 John 2.16, he says, all that's in the world that will gratify the outer man is the lust of the flesh. It was good for food. The lust of the eye. And the pride of life. When a person is proud and has self-esteem, then they become wise in their own conceits. Pride, of, the pleasant to the eye. The word idolatry, E-I-D-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A -E -E is the word idolatry. And it's a form of ido. And La Truo, L A T R E U O. La Truo means to serve. Ido means to what you see. And she looked at the tree. 
As soon as you look at sin, you want to go straight to it. Lust is the word epithumia, E-P-I-T-H-U-M-I-A. Epithumia means to breathe hard and superimpose that on your life. Breathe hard after something. Lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh says, I, I, I want her, I want him, I want that, I want that car, I want that money, I want that's the mark of the beast. A person that's taken that is not converted from self. If self doesn't die and never does die, you got the mark. You got the character. Mark of the beast just means character. Every time you, let me show you something else. Go over here to Revelation 13. If you can't recognize these things, you're one of the many to be one of the few you've got to recognize the truth look over in Revelation 13 I can't give you all these verses on Mark he's talking about the image of the beast in verse 15 in verse 16, he causeth all both small and great, talking about the beast, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark, a, a character in their forehead. What does forehead mean? Does it mean they're going to stamp on their head? No. This is copying God's mark. Look over here in Deuteronomy 6. It's copying God's mark. Deuteronomy 6. You cannot leave definition. It's the character of the beast. Do, do you think the beast waits till Revelation to bring out his character? No. The beast was here, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and the beast with iron teeth. In Daniel 7, he had a character there, didn't he? And the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He had a character there. His character is to put God's word in question. Did God mean Christmas is Christ's mass? No, no, God don't mean that. Does he mean for us not to do that? No, he don't mind. As long as we give gifts to each other and put up a tree. That's all... Baloney. He says here in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, the beast, Satan always copies God is what he does. He doesn't originate anything. Hear therefore, O Israel, observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may... In this is verse 3, chapter 6, Deuteronomy. That it may be well with thee that thou may increase mightily as the Lord God of fathers hath promised thee in the land that promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. This is in Deuteronomy, right before they cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That's where the mark, that's where the seal of God is, in your heart. He can look at a person and tell what's in his heart. I don't mean the aorta and the right ventricle and the left ventricle. I don't mean that. The heart was a place of understanding. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and then thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them on the doorposts of thy house and on thy gates. That's, the Pharisees took that, put a little black box on their head, put this in, this verse in it with a few others and they put a little black box on their left arm that's not what God's talking about he's talking whatever you hand 
goes to do, do it with all your might, do it all to the glory of God, and do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has to come from the mind. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. This is very figurative language. And then he says over there in Revelation 13 and verse 16. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a character of Satan in their right hand and in their foreheads. He's not talking about stabbing it or putting a computer chip. He's talking about in their minds that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Now notice what it says, the next phrase. The mark, the character, or, or, O-R means, here's another word for mark. Or might as well say I-E. That's Latin id est. That is to say. The mark, this is the same thing. That is to say the name of the beast. So the mark is the name. That's what he's saying here. Name is the word onoma. It means character, oh, character or authority. It means character or authority. So if, if you have the mark of the beast, you have the name of the beast written in your heart. And God hasn't converted you and written his word in your heart. Like Second Thessalonians, like Second Corinthians, the third chapter says, he hadn't written in your heart. Everybody that has the law written in their heart, they will do what God says do. Oh, you may wrestle with it for a lot of years, like I did. Go out there and live for yourself. God beat me up and about killed me in car wrecks, in the hospital. I laid on my deathbed several times. I thought I was dying. So he says, or name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Six, six, six. Or, of course, that's not literal. That is gematria. I'll go into that later. Man's number is six. He lives six days in the seventh. He rests. I believe 6,000 years man will be upon the earth and the seventh day will be eternity. Now, let me show you this mark of the beast. Go to Romans. You got to keep remembering what I said about Constantine, the edict of toleration. Tolerance. That's what God did and he tolerated Satan seducing Eve there in that Genesis, the third chapter. God put up with Satan seducing Eve. And then the mark of the beast is always pleasant. Christmas, the way men celebrate, is pleasant. Valentine's is pleasant. Halloween is pleasant. Easter is very pleasant. Isn't it all that way? Huh? Don't you feel good at all those things? You're supposed to feel good and don't call anybody down and have a ceasefire at Christmas and don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat, baby. Don't tip the boat over. Huh? The band of the Hughes Okay, <laughs> okay. Don't rock the boat. That's what my mother used to tell me because I was always telling off on those gospel singers. He's, he came to me one day and he said, I'm talking about the stars of gospel music. Back at that time was J.D. Sumner and uh, James Blackwood and uh, Hovey Lister. Those were the kings. Those were the guys on the top of gospel music. 
And my brother Dean come to me and said, they respect you, but they don't like you. <laughs> and I thought, it took me a long time to realize, Dean, they like you. What it means if they like you, they don't respect you because you're letting them get by with women, drinking, sniffing coke, smoking pot. If, you, if they like you, something's wrong. If the world likes you, it's, the Bible says in James 4 and 4, friendship with the world is enmity against God. And whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Ekthra is the word A-C-H-T-H-R-A. That's the word hostile. You're, you're hostile to God. You're hostile to God if the world likes you. The world can't like the true believer. They just can't. Maybe that's comforting to you. Maybe have you ever thought, why can I not get along with anybody? Because you're one of God's elect. You're not supposed to get along. Even before you mature, when I was a kid, I kept saying, well, why can I get along with anybody? I didn't have any buddies, had no pals, had nobody I'd run around with, not as a teenager, not even younger. I never could get along. I went to Herbert's house. He was a guy I knew... He was an acquaintance. He and I went some places together after high school. And I went to his house one day and I said, Herbert, I can't get along with anybody. I said, I don't get along with anybody, not my bands. If, if the band goes into a restaurant and I sit down, they all sit down over here, but they wouldn't sit with me. They didn't want to be around me because I was hard to get along with. I was trying to fit in the world and I would snap at people and get upset at people real easy because I wasn't living right. Have you ever wondered why you did that when you were out there in the world? Because you're not living the way you're supposed to. You're supposed to say the truth to the world. You don't have to beat people up. Just say, well, did you know it was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America? Did you know that? Just tell them to, like that. Did you know that God doesn't love everybody? Just tell them that. Just say it like that. And some of them will say, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says God loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born, before they'd done any good or evil. Have you ever heard that before? Say it in, in that kind of a tone. Don't get mad. Because you're probably talking to a vessel of wrath that's fitted to destruction that doesn't have an ear to hear. So it's nothing wrong with them being what they are. They have to go to hell one day. That's the way it works. People say, why would God do that? I don't know. He does it. He does everything after the counsel of his own will. He says, I will do this. I had a guy write me an email and said, why would God make these people to intentionally send them to hell? Because he wants to. That's why. Because he said so in his book. Now, where was I? Let's get back over here to, to Revelation. I was going somewhere and I forgot where I was going. All right. Oh, I was going to go to Romans. Go to Romans 16. This is the way the mark of the beast comes on. It's not something that happens after the end of time or at the end of time. It's always been here. Have you wondered why everybody's smooth talking? This is why it's the mark of the beast. That's the mark of the beast doesn't wait till the end of Revelation or the end of the Bible to come out. His character's always been here. Every time you see mark of the beast, just put character of the beast as the same meaning. You can't leave that definition. Now look here. This is the same thing as the edict of toleration of Constantine. Same thing. Verse 17. 16th chapter, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses 
that are contrary to the doctrines that you have learned. Contrary to the what? To the doctrine of Christ. The same thing that Satan said. Oh, God doesn't mean you'll die. You'll be as God's. He just simply took God's word and twisted it and perverted it. That's what Satan does, and that's what the mark of the beast does. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Mark, scopeo. S-K-O-P-E-O. This aligns with the edict of toleration. It aligns with the edict of Milan right here. This is what people do when they introduce you to the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast sounds like something real evil. Well, it is, but it's real smooth, this soft talk. I told a guy the other day, I said, preachers are lying. He said, well, they are, aren't they? I said, yes. They've got a soft, easy, slushy Jesus that doesn't require any suffering. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Mark, Scopeo. Get our word scope from that. S K O P E O. Scope. Aim at them, point them out. Mark them which cause divisions. This is what Satan was doing divisions. Division is the word di, 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 di kotos, di, skotos. It means two standings. It's two standings. That means there's a nice preacher preaching a slushy gospel about Christmas and Easter and then there is the truth. They cause divisions and offenses. Offenses, scandalon, S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. We get our word scandalized from that. It means it's a trip stick. It was a, a scandalon, was a little sapling that they bent it over and they put a noose on the end of it so it would catch the little animal and break its leg when it came along. That was a scandal. The world is trying to scandalize you with this other gospel that's being preached. It's slushy and mushy. It's not tribulation. It's not fire. It's not trial. It's not with great difficulty. My sister-in-law got on TV one night. She said, getting saved is easy. You're an ignoramus woman. It's not easy. You think going through tribulation is easy? When you start telling the truth, people make it hard on you. It's supposed to be hard. It's not supposed to be easy. That Christmas is easy. That's an easy Jesus. They cause divisions and offenses contrary. Contrary is the word that lines up with this Christmas up here. Contrary. Para means parallel. It's a parallel. This is pa the true Jesus. And the truth about Christmas is parallel to the false Christmas and the false Jesus. All of it has a parallel doctrine. Para is the word contrary. You've got a, a real Jesus and you've got a false Jesus. Some men will come preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Paul said, I didn't preach that Jesus. He said, I'm afraid you will bear with this man or with these people. It's all parallel, but the other Jesus plunges into hell. The real Jesus takes us to eternal life in heaven. If you can't recognize the false Jesus, you're either ignorant or an unbeliever. Maybe you're just a baby. And he says, contrary to the doctrines you have learned, and avoid these people. Avoid Eklino. E K K L I N O. Or 1K. Excuse me. Eklino. It means to lean away from. It means to lean out from, get away from them. 
And then he says, for they that are such. The ones that are preaching the mark of the beast or the other Jesus. They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Belly was an Epicurean term. The Epicureans and the Stoics were the two most popular philosophies going on in the world in the first century. The Epicureans said the seat of all desires, whether it's sensual, whether it's your desires of your flesh, was in the belly. They didn't mean the stomach. They said it was in the belly. And that if you wanted to fulfill any kind of desire you had, you had to fulfill your belly. That was their term. That's why in Philippians, the fourth chapter, certain ones at Corinth, Paul said, they, they hate the daily cross of Christ because their God is their belly and their mind is on earthly things. Mind is the word noose. Is on earthly gay. They serve, they serve not their Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly by good words and fair speeches. Good words, that's what the Christmas is of the world today. That's good words. Valentine's and Halloween and Easter are all good words and fair speeches. Good words is the word. It's this word Eulogia, E-U-L-O-G-I-A, E-U-L-O-G-I-A. That's good words. It means things that sound good are they're plausible. Oh, excuse me, it's Crestologia. It sounds Cresto. It sounds like it's good. L O G I A. Crestos means usable words. Crestol again. By good words and fair speeches. Fair speeches is that word you look E U L O G I A. It means words that are, they sound good. And they sound very intelligent. It sounds like something that makes sense. And they use big fancy words. And Paul said, I don't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. I don't come to entice you. By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. It means the innocent. Akakos, A-K-A-K-O-S. Akakos, kakos means evil. The alpha negates that. It means these are not evil people. They're just innocent people. They get deceived by good words and fair speeches. Some preacher gets in the pulpit and he uses $20 words. I don't even understand half the words that that uh, the guy down in Florida uh R.C. Sproul, he used $20 words every sentence. I didn't understand them, and I've got a lot of vocabulary that most people don't have, but I didn't understand his words. He was had a lot of education. He liked to parade his intellect. So good words and fair speeches is the same thing as tolerance. They're going to tolerate a false Christmas, a false Halloween, a false Easter, and baptism, and crackers and grape juice. If they'll pass around crackers and grape juice, and you can take that little cup and go, take that little piece of cracker and eat that, then that's easy, isn't it? But drinking of a cup meant to undergo a death. And partaking of the body is to partake of the body of Christ, which is the church. And if you're part of the body of Christ, you're going to suffer. It has nothing to do with crackers and grape juice. That's easy. 
Anybody can take a cracker and eat it and take a little cup of grape juice and swallow it down. Anybody. I think, I really believe that we're in the end times because the mark is here. The character of Satan is running wild and rampant in America. Every time you turn around on the news, they're trying to legalize something that God has said is illegal. Aren't they doing that? They're going to legalize homosexuality and let them get married and let them have, have tax breaks and, and give them all the breaks that a married couple have and congratulate them. What gets me is when you watch that goofy woman on TV, what's her name, the homosexual? Uh, Ellen DeGeneres. She says, so-and-so is coming out of the closet and they're all going, yay! Stupid. She might as well say, they're, they're going to come out and they're going to, uh, they're going to go against God. Yay! It's dumb people. I don't know if they've ever read the first chapter of Romans. Men with men, which was doing things that are unseemly. Or the 21st chapter of Leviticus, it just. So I hope you can see the good words and fair speeches of the nice Christmas and the nice Easter goes along with the edict of toleration. This is just tolerance of God's word, twisting it, perverting it, and having one's way with it. And it's not what God wants us to do. I guess I'm out of time, ain't I, Mike? Two minutes. Two minutes. The serpent. The word serpent means to enchant. This goes along with dragon. Dracon. The dragon there in Revelation 12 and 13 means to fascinate. They fascinate you with this doctrine of Christmas and of Halloween and Valentine's and Easter. They fascinate you, don't they? Make you feel good. See, if you define dragon, you look here at Romans 16, 17, you define the edict of toleration, you get back to the garden where the serpent, no cause, enchant. It's enchanting to have your way in the flesh. If your flesh can have its way, I've had to beat my flesh into submission. I constantly pray, Lord, this sin is in my life. You need, you need to help me overcome it. I pray against my own sin. You ever do that? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. I feel like I'm not quite getting everything over. I pray you wake people up. Let them see what's going on in the world. All of this permissive sin that's happening. That your people can see this. And that we'll stand against it. Not in a mean way. Just tell people this is what the truth is. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. We pray, man. I feel like I was stumbling this morning. There's so much to say about all this.
Hey, Jess. You got your money, didn't you? Yeah, I got the money, I think. Okay. We got the money, didn't we? Okay.